All right, you're listening to the show Fresh right here on KUNM 89.9 FM. Started out with some groundation, and uh, we're gonna depart from the usual routine of just playing music, which is what I normally have been doing, and uh, to take advantage of this time to talk to you. Got a guest in the studio tonight, Katie. Uh, she's a documentary filmmaker, and she's got a piece that's going to be showing at Global Kirky on Saturday at 11. It's called Greening the Revolution. It's about food justice uh, around the world, and I'm really glad she came up here. I'm excited to talk to her. We're going we're gonna to talk for a little bit. 277-5615 is the number if you have any questions or comments, but uh, meantime, welcome. Thank you. I didn't know this was a call-in show. <laughs> <laughs> Let's let me put this right over here. There you go. Is that better? Yeah, you can get right up next to the mic. Um, and it's just to be clear, it is not this coming Saturday, but um, the next Saturday. Global Kirky is September 25th and 26th. Yeah. Yeah, so it'll be showing on um, September 26th at 11 a.m. at the Hispanic Cultural Center. And that that part of the Global Cookie is free and well, open to all, right? Yeah, it's actually an awesome part of the day. It's free from um, 10.30 to, I think, 4. And uh, they're going to have tons of stuff for kids. They're going to have a, um, a musical petting zoo, which I think sounds really cool. And um, traditional um, dance lessons from uh, musicians from other countries, from uh, Russia. And um, let's see, they're going to have another film, an Oscar-nominated film this from this year. They are going to have um, uh, different artists and musicians with exhibits and giving talks and just lots of really amazing stuff for the whole family. Yeah. Yeah, Global Kirky is a great experience. So uh, let's get right into it. You want to just kind of encapsulate encapsulate a little bit of uh, what your film is about, give people a little introduction to it? Sure. Well, Greening the Revolution, in short, is about food justice. And... A long explanation, a longer one, would be that it was filmed in Cuba, Mexico, Haiti, Kenya, Zambia, India, Brazil, and several locations across the U.S. And it focuses on the injustices related to food, injustices such as um, hunger, farmer suicides, diabetes, um, and then it looks at the other side of the coin, which is also the truth about food today, and that is the resistance to the different causes of food injustice and sustainable solutions that are being practiced and implemented by farmers around the world. And it really focuses on interviews with small farmers from around the world who are really amazing and powerful, amazing, powerful people. I felt really honored to have talked with them. Wonderful. Yeah, that's something uh, I feel like that people that are concerned about injustice, activists, uh, anybody who is working in that area, you know, it's really easy to get overwhelmed. It's easy to feel like there's nothing we can do or it's easy to feel hopeless. So, I'm really happy to hear that you've got uh, stories from around the world of people that are actually resisting and acting, doing something, making making change in their community or, you know, preserving their traditions. Yeah, I think that that's the only fair way to talk about the situation of food in the world today it's because there are so many horrific, horrible things happening, and that is one side that we have to know about and we have to acknowledge and we need to know the causes of but then it's only truthful to talk about the other side and and all the incredible people that are resisting huge economic political um military powers 
and are creating their own um, alternatives, often by facing actual guns and paramilitaries. And so it's a real it's a really big struggle for a lot of people around the world to implement sustainable often organic farming it's it's a really big struggle and um but it's often a matter of life and death so did did you actually go yourself and visit all these different countries i did i did yeah i um i went legally to cuba um though i would have been fine going illegally also (laughs) um but uh, I went with a great organization who has a um, travel education visa called Global Exchange, and they were in partnership with Food First, and they actually um, gave me a partial scholarship to go. And uh, that was the first location I went to, and I borrowed a friend's camera, and um, the idea of this film was just forming then. And uh, I went to Cuba for 10 days, and then um, the next was to Mexico with a with a close friend of mine who helped me do interviews with the Zapatistas in Chiapas, which were, um, they were just a tiny bit intimidating (laughs) because everyone wears a mask, um, as you'll see in the movie. And, um, and then I spent, um, a couple weeks in Africa, several weeks in India, and then, um, off and on during the next couple of years throughout, uh, the U.S. That uh, must have been an incredible experience. It was. I feel really, really grateful to have had that experience. Really grateful. So let's talk a little bit about uh, some specific examples, like uh, like in Haiti, for example. Well, uh, I went to Haiti because I had read about um, that some of the people there during times of extreme hunger were forced to eat mud. And uh, so that was what, that was why I decided to go to Haiti was that I needed to document hunger so severe that um, people were willing to eat dirt. And um, it was a really, it was an extremely intense trip. Um, I went I went by myself. Um, of course, I, I didn't like wander around Haiti by myself, but I, I went by myself and then I met up with some journalists there who had written some really great articles about agriculture and this, the overall political system in Haiti and um, with what I thought was a really great point of view. And um, they and then about, I don't know, probably about <laughs> five or six other, uh, like, Haitian men um, walked with me through Cire Soleil, which is Haiti's poorest slum, really. And um, and there we went and interviewed women who make the the mud cookies. The uh, they, they look like cookies. So, um, and um, we interviewed we went to a one other thing that I thought was really important to document and I happened to do it in Haiti though I could have documented it anywhere was how extreme economic conditions have forced women into prostitution and more specifically in regards to food how so many uh, women farmers that have been forced off the land because they've been outcompeted or because their land has been sold out, privatized, you know, right underneath them, enter the urban areas and do either there are not jobs available, as, you know, the government will almost always promise, you know, there's so many jobs in the city, and women will often have to sell themselves in order to provide for their kids. So I went into a, I guess you would call it brothel in Cere Soleil and interviewed some of the women that were working there. And I just talked to them about conditions for, um, uh, you know, food prices, what the food prices were like, what they would 
rather be doing, you know, than doing that, um, what their life was like as, you know, living as a prostitute um, under these conditions. It was, it was, man, it was, Haiti really was probably the most, um, well, there were a lot of intense situations, but it was one of the most intense. And then another um, important interview I did there was with a farmer who was still clinging to his land. Um, but in Haiti, a lot of the, as in many countries, a lot of the schools are private and, um, or in some areas, all. And you can only get your kids an education by paying for it. And he was not able to grow enough food and um, and sell that food for a fair price to pay for his children's education. So it was it was very eye opening as to how far food and agriculture affect our lives and the lives of people around the world. You know, just from kids either being able or not being able to get an education, which in Haiti and in so many countries is just a huge, huge deal. It's so important. I mean, he was crying over the fact that he couldn't send his kids to school. And uh, yeah, it was just it was just really heartbreaking. But, um, you know, they also the people it, anywhere, but the people I interviewed in Haiti, I don't mean to make them sound like mm, like like helpless or that they they were just very very strong people dealing with incredibly horrible circumstances um that had been inflicted on them you know through the economic and political policies from the US and France and other countries and economies around the world so they were incredibly strong and inspiring just from doing what they were doing. So, it, but that's kind of a long answer to your question. What about Haiti? <laughs> <laughs> I love Haiti, though. I went back there to teach a couple years later at a journalism school there. And um, th- that was that was really great. Wow. Well, um, yeah, we just went right, right to the heart of things, didn't yeah. we? <laughs> wow. Um, Maybe Haiti is a too complex of an example, but I wanted to ask you a little bit about in your travels, um, kind of the intersection of corporate control of land and how that's affecting farmers worldwide. And I don't know if you just speak a little bit about that, the situation that's going on right now worldwide. I feel like we're in a real bubble here. We just take it for granted that we can go to the store and we assume that Everybody everywhere can just go to the store and get food, but uh, I was wondering if you right. talk a little bit about that. Um, yeah, in fact, I remember in Haiti, like a can of tuna fish, which the grocery store was um, guarded by um, UN soldiers, but it was four dollars just a can of tuna fish. Um, anyway, I think that the topic of land is incredibly important, and Um, in the film and, you know, when talking about it, I really like to look at Mexico and, uh, what's happened with land there. And during the Mexican revolution, small farmers won the right to farm communally on what was, what was previously, uh, unattainable land. And when the North American Free Trade Agreement went through in 1994, it actually removed that part regarding regarding land, regarding ejidos, that's what mm-hmm. they're called, um, removed that from the Constitution. And, uh, and so you have farmers who are struggling to find land that whose land has been uh, taken from them. Or, uh, you know, when attempting to to stay on land that they've been farming on for generations, are face to face with the Mexican military, and um, it 
it's uh, it's very dire circumstances for land, and it is definitely around the world. And every single free trade agreement that gets made um, worsens the situation of farmers and land. But in Mexico, it's uh, it's pretty black and white what exactly has happened. You know, for the economic interests of Mexico and the U.S., this part of the Constitution was removed, taking away the right of millions of, of small farmers to, to farm. And so um, it just puts you face-to-face -face with the, the cause of the problem, you know, and who it is we need to be uh, fighting those interests and in, of of those governments and um, and their economic policies. And then, of course, the corporations that step in afterwards, you know, after land is privatized and can go, um, um, American corporations that can go grow soybeans in Mexico and Brazil, they love growing soybeans in South America. And uh, of course, they're genetically engineered and use it, tons of pesticides and herbicides and everything that poisons the water and poisons the land and so it's a really toxic situation overall it's it's just extremely toxic and somewhat complicated i mean i don't even begin to understand um land rights throughout the world i just have a very basic understanding of it and from talking to different farmers about how they're able to farm and how they got their land. And in Cuba, it's interesting because in the Cuban Revolution, um, farmers were given plots of land to farm, especially if they had been a farm worker on a, uh, a privately held large farm. And so farmers in uh, Cuba don't have a problem usually having access to land to farm. I noticed in your film that you had some... Uh interviews with uh, representatives from Monsanto. Mm -hmm. <laughs> what was it like talking to them? Uh, and did you talk to them after you had already started traveling around the world and mm -hmm. looking at things from the other side of the coin? I had. Yeah, it was really, really scary, actually. <laughs> well, and I got those interviews because um, I had secured an interview with a director of the FDA. And one of the biggest things I learned in DC and of course you know people tell it to you all the time but um, or you hear about it all the time is that everyone knows each other and everyone is connected in trying to help each other out and the corporate government connections are all over the place and you know the revolving door of you know working for the government working for a corporation working for the government etc uh, exists everywhere and it is so apparent and obvious in the food and agriculture departments and um, yeah I had gotten an interview with the director of the FDA and then um, from there I got interviews with um, the uh, the secretary the undersecretary for the USDA and then the um, World Trade Organization rep for the USDA, some other people. And then um, finally, I went to Monsanto's DC offices and interviewed the vice president for government relations, which basically means the person who goes and makes all the deals with the government officials, including the things that get put into these trade policies and agreements. Mm hmm. And, uh, <laughs> and yes, it was terrifying. It was just really scary <laughs> because I knew, I mean, I knew like what, you know, the significant, all of those offices, I knew the significance of them, you know, that mm -hmm. they really were tied to people's life and death and um, scary. Well, I don't like DC. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> did they seem to uh, believe in what they were doing or did you? Um, did you feel not... like that that was just a veneer underneath the uh, true motive of, of profit at any any cost? Uh, yeah, it did seem that there was no underlying questioning of capitalism or <laughs> you know, the profit motive 
or um, I mean, really, even in one of the things that didn't make it into the film that was so disgusting was when the director of the FDA was talking about how he wrote out the uh, the agriculture parts, the the food and agriculture related parts of NAFTA, the North American Free Trade Agreement, which I knew had, um, you know, had caused severe hunger and malnutrition, you know, for millions of Mexicans. And he was uh, kind of bragging about how he did it in like three days with the help of a couple assistants, you know, getting him food or whatever, you know, I mean, it was just that was repulsive. And, um, and it was kind of, I mean, Monsanto, they definitely kind of try to the veneer of their corporation seems to be, um, you know, helping feed the world. Like we're making these seeds so that the world can be fed. And, uh, but I think underneath that, they are very unapologetic about making any type of profits off of those seeds, which in fact often do the opposite, you know, and that was what, um, <laughs> talking about India, that was uh, what I focused on when I went to India was the, um, the, uh, the incredible numbers, I think it's 300,000 now, of how many small farmers have committed suicide. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, you've probably heard about it it's been there's been um more media around it and Vandana Shiva who I uh, also interviewed in India and who was the one who directed me towards the the part of India that I went to Punjab uh talked a lot about the epidemic of farmer suicides and the role that large seed corporations like Monsanto have to do with that so you had some real heavyweights in your film Vandana Shiva <laughs> Uh, Howard Zinn. Mm -hmm. uh, wow, that must have been great. Yeah. Noam Chomsky. Mm -hmm. Yeah, they were kind of like my rock stars. Yeah, <laughs> they were. Yeah, they were great. Noam Chomsky and Howard Zinn were just the most beautiful, humble, brilliant men. They were just wonderful. They were just so kind and sweet and humble, and uh, were great interviews. I mean, you could you could interview. Noam Chomsky about anything. I mean, you could go to him with a documentary about anything, and he would be able to give you sound bites for the whole thing, uh -huh. you know. And um, and unfortunately, we've lost Howard Zinn since then. But uh, yeah, that was a, a true honor to be able to hang out with him for a little while and and talk with him. I bet. Yeah, it really was. Wow. Yeah. Did you? Uh... I'm just trying to imagine myself in your shoes. Did you have a moment where you're like, holy crap, I'm talking to Howard Zinn? Yeah. Or, <laughs> yeah. How did this happen? I know. I mean, because not only is he a, or was a brilliant um, writer and, and teacher and historian, but he had also, his life was also living history, you know, with um, a lot of work in the civil rights movement. And yeah, he they're both just really really inspiring well that's that's great that you just were carried along through making this film into all these amazing encounters yeah definitely um i noticed that uh the part of your the name of your production company is something to do with like indigenous film or oh my editor who um is amazing. His name is Klee Benali, and uh, he's also a musician. And uh, but he, he's a super talented editor. And this film, I mean, it would have been very difficult to have gotten it done without him because he pretty much donated his time. I mean, I was able to um, pay him, but not anything close to what he deserved. And um, but he just really, yeah, believed in the film and was able to do it. And uh, his media 
organization is called Indigenous Action Media, and he uh, he's Navajo or Diné, and he lives in northern Arizona and also does a lot of work with Out of Your Backpack Media, which is an organization helping to train and empower uh, Native youth in making media. So, yeah, he's he's wonderful. And uh, I think he, he just released a solo album somewhat recently that yeah. people can look up and find, yeah. Yeah, I've definitely I heard his name before. Mm-hmm. Um, I met him doing um, activist work in um, in Flagstaff, where uh, there was a. It's still it's an, an ongoing fight against the Arizona Snow Bowl, and um, they're a ski resort that has been trying to um, make snow out of literal sewer water on land that's. Um, sacred to 13 indigenous tribes so it was a good way to me and um yeah and i hope to be able to work with him again sometime great um I, i'm just curious a little bit i'd like to talk a little bit about what it means to be an activist and how you can be effective as an activist particularly i mean once we start getting concerned about things you know it doesn't you don't have to dig very deep below the surface to come up against these pretty horrifying realities of of what's going on in the world and um you know you really like we started right off talking about haiti you really you really uh got to the core of that I was just wondering if you could talk a little bit about um, where you're coming from where where you find the strength to keep going or if you feel hopeful positive um. about the world in general <laughs> yeah about the future uh, if you do you have faith that that your work is is gonna have a positive impact in the world that um I hope so. I mean, I I hope that this film is of some use and, you know, impacts people to a point where there is some attempt at uh, change or, I mean, that's the entire reason I I made it was, was really, I mean, mostly to build solidarity between, um, you know, these different areas of the of the world that are engaging in in so much struggle so that um you know we can stand together in in what we're against and for and in what we're for and um that sounds really generic but um you know my film is really showing is really showing the the struggles and, and triumphs of of what different movements around the world are doing. And in the U.S., um, one of my favorite organizations that I just think is so brilliant in in enacting change and, um, and in organizing and, and educating and uh, is the coalition of Amakali workers in Florida, in Amakali, Florida. I went there and um, interviewed uh, a bunch of people there and filmed some of the uh, workers in the in the fields. And they have an incredible organizing model, which basically is educating the community gathering support from the community, which, um, and by the community, I mean um, Immokalee, which is uh, just made up of farm workers, mostly from uh, Haiti, Mexico, and Guatemala, um, almost all undocumented. And, uh, you know, they do community meetings where they do political education, where they, you know, talk about their own campaigns they have won an increase um a 
uh, let's see, what is it, a penny a pound increase from all the huge chains, McDonald's, even Walmart, Burger King. I mean, they've just been able to amass through, you know, strikes, hunger strikes, and just incredible organizing um, an actual difference for the life of the farm worker. And I think they're one of the most inspiring examples of really bringing, um, you know, they didn't bring these corporations to their knees, but they actually won something from corporations that are extremely, extremely difficult to get any kind of concession from, you know, and uh, that's, that says a lot. That's pretty powerful, especially when the majority of uh, the organizers are undocumented. I mean, it's just, it's pretty incredible. Yeah. Yeah. Great. So, uh, but oh, do I feel ho- hopeful yeah. about the world? Well, sure. Um, yeah, keep going. <laughs> <laughs> um, yes, I feel. I don't. I mean, I don't know. I don't. I mean, I don't have any. You know, magic way to look into the future. I'll. I mean, I think we're up against an incredible amount. I don't know if. Uh, if I'm going to see what I would call true justice for humanity in in my lifetime. Um, I don't think that I'm personally doing enough. Um, I, I don't know. Yeah. Maybe. I mean, I have uh, hope. I mean, I do have hope. I think hope is real and hope is very important, you know, and, but I draw my hope from like the, the powerful movements that are actually existing in the Mm -hmm. world, you know, also from history. I mean, we can, you know, definitely draw a lot of hope from history, but uh, I think I find it empowering to draw hope from the people around the world Mm -hmm. who are really, uh, you know, surviving and standing up against this stuff. Yeah. Or maybe hope is the wrong word. Maybe we don't don't (laughs) necessarily need hope, but it, that's beautiful. I mean, you found strength, maybe. Oh, for sure. From uh, for sure. From going and talking to all these people. That oh, definitely. Didn't just show you the face of oppression, but they showed you the face of survival. Oh yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah. I have nothing to complain about in my life. Yeah. 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 Well, it sounds like a a beautiful film. We have a really good. A vibrant farming agricultural scene here and I hope all the local farmers and supporters of farmers can can make it out I really hope so too yes please tell all the farmers you know that would be great I, I would love to get up oh and there's going to be a panel afterwards um, after the film uh, with myself and um, I think at least one local farmer um but possibly a farmer from um, the Española area, um, and then one one or two farmers, and and maybe a community organizer here working on food justice issues. So um, that's not all set in stone yet, but that'll be a great panel. Great. So what's next for you? Right. Uh, for me, well, I. Uh, last year started to film um, I did one shoot for my next film and uh, it's untitled as of right now but it is about the um, basically the political how did I, I had it worded, I had it worded how I wanted the, the other day. Um, it's basically the political implications of sexual assault. And um, as well as looking at what very affected communities are doing to heal from a, a history of sexual assault and become politically organized and, and active around that. So um, I just, I feel that, I think, I think that so many communities that are most ravaged by um, things such as sexual assault 
or, um, you know, poverty, war, uh, are often the communities least politically represented. And I think it is extremely difficult to be uh, political or have any type of voice when um, when there's healing that needs to happen and all around you um, violence is continuing. And so I started by, um, and so again, this film, <laughs> it sounds uh, like it's gonna be super heavy and part of it is super heavy. Um, but I don't know if I've gotten myself into a rut already, but I, I think that by looking at issues, we have to look at um, at, at both the, the tragedy and, I will use your word, hope. And, uh, and so I filmed in, um, on the Mohawk, on a Mohawk reservation in upstate New York, and then on another Mohawk reservation in, um, in Canada. And in Canada, I interviewed the survivors of one of the, I think it was actually the first boarding school in North America uh, that uh, Native children were coerced into attending. And, uh, and these survivors, I mean, they just blew my mind. I mean, I thought that, uh, I thought that it was going to be really just completely depressing to interview them, you know. But they were so strong and so inspiring, and they held each other up so strongly that uh, it was, again, I just felt really honored to have talked with them about their experiences. And their experiences were, you know, being um, victims of terrible abuse and um, by the, um, I think it was actually an Anglican church, but they had, you know, like priests and nuns and um the uh and if you look at the abuse on at boarding schools around North America it was so brutal um it was so brutal that and of course it was brought back to the reservation you know after they left the school if they survived there's also been graves found at some of these schools I mean it's just brutal but there's no I don't see any other way that the rate of sexual assault on reservations could be today anything other than what it is because of that history. And I think it's so important to understand um, the root causes, at least to some extent, the root causes of different types of injustice. Because if we don't know what those are, if um, if you know, people are just racist and say, oh, you know, those people are, you know, they're just more prone to rape or, you know, whatever, whatever crap. If you're not looking at like the root causes, it's very difficult to, to fight it. And, um, and on the, the Mohawk Reservation in upstate New York, they are just doing some amazing things to really f fight assault and heal their communities. And, um, and one of the most important things actually is, and I heard this also from some of the survivors in Canada, is uh, keeping their native language or native Mohawk language. And um, I mean, to the point where I did not appreciate how, imp I did not appreciate how important uh, language was. I mean, I knew intellectually, but then when I was interviewing some of these women and just like, you know, crying over like the sacred importance of having this language, you know, and a language that is spoken and taught from kindergarten on up about valuing women and treating each other with respect, you know, mm -hmm. and lessons that you do not hear being taught in um, in most elementary schools, though I do have some uh, friends and a partner who are amazing teachers. But, uh, you know, you don't hear those kinds of lessons being being taught everywhere. And they're doing other great programs like um, uh, where there's these, um, uh, what do you call it? I guess just ceremonies, um, like for girls when they hit puberty and where they're asked by one of their elders if they have ever been abused. And if they have, then um, they get them not just, um, you know, counseling and the, the things that they need in, um, in that direction, but also 
uh, mentoring spiritually and everything. So, uh, and I mean, I could just go on and on the the amazing things that they're they're doing. And so, uh, like that is f- fills me with hope and inspiration, mm-hmm. definitely. Yeah, sounds like a perfectly natural continuation of of the first film. I mean, kind of go from the body of our Mother Earth to women's bodies specifically. So uh, what do you feel like some of the root causes of this this violence towards the Earth or towards women are? <laughs> ah, that's a big question. <laughs> that's the kind of questions that I would ask no Chomsky. <laughs> <Cool. laughs> <laughs> they would have really good answers, but um, well, I would have to start out by saying an economic system that prioritizes profits over people, where um, where the price of corn is more important than whether someone gets food that day. So I will just, in general, call that capitalism. Um, but there's obviously, you know, great inequalities in, in everything before capitalism. But, you know, I I mean, I guess I could, I don't know if it sounds redundant, but to say colonialism, I mean, all over the world. I mean, just, you know, not just North America, but the entire continent of Africa. And I remember I asked... Um, a photographer that I was with in Kenya, we were just talking about different things and we were talking about Rwanda. And I said, why do you think that Rwanda happened? And he said, the African mind is so colonized, you know, that I just think colonialism is just, oh man, what it has done to this world. But, uh, you know, imperialism, all the, um, theisms but yeah so I really want to do a better job of answering this question so I'm just going to answer simply for for today a economic system that um, uh, like I said before just repeating myself an economic system that values profits over people and you could say, obviously, the earth it values profits over people in the earth. And that's a pretty big economic system we're up against, you know. So and I include us in that, too, just as, uh, you know, regular working class people that that we're up against that system, too, which is really important to remember. Yeah. Yeah. We're uh, we're part of it, but we're also increasingly feeling the uh you know the ill effects of it as well for sure here in new mexico Mm -hmm. for sure well where else are you planning on going uh are you going to go to other countries africa again or um yes i have i have some ideas but i'm just not positive what i have to do next is secure um funding because uh it was very, very difficult to um, to this film got made so slowly because it was it was a conglomeration of grants and donations and fundraisers and all of this stuff and it just that part takes so much work and energy and uh, and I have to do some of that fundraising and grant writing and everything before I can um, do another shoot. So I'm going to put together a trailer from this shoot that I did and then submit it and uh, maybe probably maybe do an online fundraiser or a fundraiser in town. We'll we'll see what what happens. Great. Well, uh, where can people get more information about you, the projects you're working on now and about the film? Uh, you can go to www.greeningtherevolution.org, uh, greeningtherevolution.org 
is um, a website that has a preview of this current film that's showing a global Kirky and uh, a little information about um, you know some of the awards and uh, photographs you know production stills <laughs> and um, yeah so that would be the best way oh you could also go to Facebook um, Greening the Revolution on Facebook and and like us there and yeah all right yeah and you can go to globalkirky.org for more information on global kirky well once again i'll just reiterate i hope uh, if any of you farmers are still awake out there or if someone you love is a farmer let's try and get them to come out 11 a.m it's a week from this saturday it's free it's down at the national hispanic cultural center Sounds like it's going to be a really inspiring, uh, uplifting, eye-opening uh, film. So I really want to thank you sincerely thank you. for uh, the work that you've already done and wish you the best in the work that you're going to keep on doing. Thank you so much. Yeah. It's been fun. All right. Well. Have there been any calls? I don't know. I haven't even looked. <laughs> I don't even know where the uh, phone <laughs> button is going to light up at. <laughs> I'm sure most people know by now, if you're a dedicated KUNM listener, that <laughs> we're temporarily in a new studio with all new equipment. Um, so you just have to, to bear with me. This is my first night up here and with the new stuff. So um, thanks again, Katie. And Thank you, Mark. Yeah. Hopefully we'll be able to get you on during the day and get you uh, exposed to some more people and you'll have a good turnout. That'd be great. All right. Well... This is the show Fresh. This is KUNM 89.9 FM. Uh, we're just going to bring up this uh, ambient music for a minute while we uh, get some other stuff organized here. We'll be here until 1 a.m. Coffee Express after that.